What does it all mean? This is where the archaeology has been found. Oh, hi, how are you? Oh, look at that. I, I need a, a planter. A shrine to a belly button. This is a rock of salt? Look at that. No one gets into this place. No one. Whoa, don't take me too far. Now that's naked archaeology. We're in Caesarea, in modern Israel. This is Caesarea, built by Herod the Great. Behind me, some of the greatest archaeological sites in the world. The oldest hippodrome, you know, this is where they raced Ben-Hur style chariots. And this is connected to the story of Jesus. How so? After Herod died and Judea stopped being ruled by Jews, it started being ruled by Romans. And one of the most infamous of those Romans stood right where I'm standing. He was Pontius Pilate, the man who sent Jesus to the cross. I'm on a quest to find that man and figure out what can we and what can we not know about the historical Pontius Pilate. According to the Gospels, at Passover in the year 32, the Jewish authorities were worried about a rabbi from Nazareth. This man, Jesus of Nazareth, stirs up the people to rebel against our religion. So they engineered his arrest and sent him to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Pilate brought him before a crowd of his fellow Jews and told them that, I find no fault in this man. And when the crowd insisted that Jesus be crucified, Pilate washed his hands of the whole affair. The trouble is, the Gospels aren't an eyewitness account. Some of them were written in the late first century by early Christian refugees after the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the Holy Temple. And that was almost 40 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. Does it make sense that the Jewish crowd is screaming for the blood of a fellow Jew? He should be put to death, he must die! And the one with doubts, even remorse, is the Roman? It almost sounds as though the Gospels have it backwards. I want to know what archaeology has to say. The trial of Jesus took place in Jerusalem. But most of the time, Pilate lived here. Caesarea was the home of the Roman governor center of trade and the center for many of the Romans' favorite leisure activities. And here, archaeologists uncovered an inscription. Joseph Patrick showed me the Pilate stone, on which the name of Pontius Pilate is clearly inscribed. Am I, am I right that this is really, right, the, the, the reference to Pontius Pilate found here is the only undisputed connection between a character in the Gospels, in the Christian Bible, and archaeology. Yes, you're right. It is a, a, real, a real touch with it's history. It's a real synchronicity. Yes. Even more interesting to archaeologists was the first word of the inscription, Tiberium. The Tiberium was a structure built under Pilate as a tribute to the Emperor Tiberius. Archaeologists believe that the Tiberium may have been near the amphitheater. And what the structure was offers a clue about the relationship between Pilate and the Jews. According to uh, the prevailing opinion, the Tiberium was a, a temple or an altar dedicated to Tiberius. He was sucking up to the emperor. Well, <laughs> I not use this uh, term, but... Uh... I just want to understand this, because I didn't understand it before. The stone is, is dedicatory, and it attests to the fact that Pontius Pilate built this Tiberium in honor of the emperor. But you're saying there was a cult, so it's not just paying homage to the powerful emperor, it's actually uh, Worshipping. Exactly, exactly. They were conceived, uh, uh, the emperors were conceived as gods in the East. If the Emperor Tiberius was worshipped as a god, Pilate would have had more than a passing interest in Jesus. The Gospels repeatedly say that Pilate believed that Jesus had not committed a crime. But the archaeology shows that Jesus was a threat to the cult of the emperor in Judea. 
and Pilate would have needed no other reason to crucify the man who was being called the Messiah. I decided to follow the text back to the place where the capture and trial of Jesus took place to see what else the archaeology tells us. And in Jerusalem, right along the Stations of the Cross, there are tantalizing clues that the Gospels might have gotten Pilate wrong. The Gospels describe Pontius Pilate as being reluctant to crucify Jesus because he didn't think Jesus had committed a crime. But the archaeology shows that for Pilate, the Roman Emperor was a god, and Jesus might have been a threat. The Gospels also describe a large crowd of Jews at Jesus' trial who demand the crucifixion. Famously, Pilate washes his hands and says, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. Most people see the hand washing as a symbolic act, but to me, it doesn't even seem Roman. And in Jerusalem, there's evidence of what the hand-washing is all about in every restaurant. If Pontius Pilate was alive today and he was in Jerusalem, as he was then, he'd come here to an Italian restaurant, right? <laughs> he misses Rome, he wants to have a pizza. And why is this important? I'll tell you what's important, because there's something wrong with the text. He washes his hands of his sins. What's he doing? That's not Roman, that's Jewish. And I'll make the point, you can find naked archaeology in the pizza place in Jerusalem today. Come with me. This is for ritual washing. Now the thing that Pontius Pilate does, he'd never do it. It's in every Jewish restaurant. Look at that. You're not washing your hands, you're washing your soul. It's a Jewish thing, like bagels and lox. And pizza nowadays. He couldn't have done it. Someone messed with the text. Maybe it was the Jewish high priest Caiaphas who washed his hands at the trial of Jesus, disavowing Pilate's death sentence. The biblical book of Deuteronomy instructs Jewish leaders to wash their hands in order to cleanse themselves of responsibility for a murder they could not prevent. Why did the authors of the Gospels change the story? And what about the rest of the trial? The Gospel of John says the trial of Jesus took place at the Praetorium, Latin for headquarters. It was here that Pilate, sitting on his judgment seat, pointed to Jesus and mocked him, saying, Ecce homo, or, Behold the man. The Gospels don't say where the Praetorium was, but tradition tells us that it was the Antonia Fortress overlooking the temple where 600 Roman soldiers were garrisoned. Archaeologists have uncovered what remains of the fortress. Professor Helen Bond showed me where tradition suggests the trial of Jesus took place. Why would this be even associated with Jesus? It's because this is all part of the Antonia Fortress. It's, it's the place where the Antonia Fortress was. And people started looking for a pavement. And the reason for that is that John's Gospel says that Pilate put his judgment seat on a pavement. He calls it the Lithostratos. Lithostrotos is the Greek word for pavement. And there are certainly enough of those under the fortress. But archaeologists soon discovered that the stones here date to 200 years after the trial of Jesus. John's Gospel has another clue. An extra word. Gabata. Which the text says is Hebrew for Lithostrotos. In fact, it means more. Now this is the actual quote in John. It says... When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat at a place called Lithostrotos, in Hebrew, Gabata. Except the problem is that's not a good translation. In, when you see in uh, litho, you think of, in English, Neolithic, Stone Age, right? In Hebrew, gab, Gaba, Gaboa, Gavoa, means high, high stone pavement, and not just a street or a pavement. That makes more sense that Pilate wouldn't take his seat and put it out on... No, he's not just out on the, on the ground in the street. Yeah, I think some kind of high raised area where people can see him too, because it's a public judgment. There aren't any remains of a raised pavement here. So all that links the Antonia Fortress to the trial of Jesus is tradition. If Pilate tried Jesus here, Jesus would have carried the cross through the streets of Jerusalem on his way to the crucifixion at Calvary. 
Modern day pilgrims follow this route, starting at the Antonia Fortress and proceeding along the Via Dolorosa to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. But according to Professor Bond, the long route itself is evidence that the trial didn't take place here at all. The whole idea of crucifixion was that it was a very public, very demeaning execution, but I think the Romans would have wanted to get him on the cross quite quickly, really. I don't think they would have wanted to parade him through a hugely busy city. You want to get him on the cross, and then everybody sees him. Everybody sees his humiliation. Anybody who claims to be a king, any of his followers, you know, you're all going to end up like this sorry guy. But I don't think they'd have risked parading him round the town before he was on the cross. If Pilate was wary of a Jewish uprising at the sight of Jesus being paraded through the streets, then it seems unlikely that he would have allowed a Jewish crowd to gather at the early morning trial. The mob demanding crucifixion may be another embellishment added by the authors of the Gospels. Are the Gospels shifting the blame from Pilate to the Jews? And where is the stone platform described in the Gospels? I decided to look at the historical record and discovered that it points away from the tourists and right to the place where Jesus was tried. The Gospels paint a pretty favorable portrait of Pontius Pilate. I would release this man. But I found evidence that there may be more to the story than the Gospels are telling. If the Gospels tell us that Pilate was reluctant to persecute a Jew, the historian Josephus tells us he didn't start out that way. Six years before the trial of Jesus, Pilate arrived in Judea, and he immediately offended the citizens of Jerusalem. I asked Professor Joseph Patrick what happened. Pilate brought uh, secretly by night uh, the standards of uh, the army in the standards Jerusalem. are the big poles they march around that exactly. we see that in old Hollywood films They're, they had on them images of the emperor images of the emperor on the top which were forbidden to be brought uh, to Jerusalem uh, so I just want to get this straight the Jews don't want those standards with the images of the emperor in Jerusalem exactly it's against it's Jewish against their law, law. a delegation of citizens came to Caesarea and protested for almost a week and even though Pilate eventually gave in to their demands, Pilate's response foreshadowed the brutality of his rule. On the sixth day, he ordered the army to uh, uh, get uh, uh, hidden in the stadium. Right over there? Right over there. So the army could attack the Jews uh, uh, in surprise, but uh, the Jews were ready to die and not to violate uh, their uh, uh, law. And uh, then uh, a pilot gave up and ordered the shield to be removed uh, from Jerusalem. They come here, he makes them wait five days, he puts his army secretly over here to kill them. Yes, uh, he, he, he said to be inflexible, he was merciless, he was obstinate. Uh, this, uh, uh, this brought a lot of friction. If Pilate was unafraid to offend the Jews at the beginning of his rule, the Gospels imply that he changed. In some accounts, he even expresses regret for crucifying Jesus. Take this man down from the cross. In fact, the historical record shows that Pilate rarely hesitated to crucify his enemies. In Jerusalem, Helen Bond told me of another Messiah, and this time, Pilate's hands were definitely dirty. Jesus was not the only Messiah that Pilate got really mad at. Yes, that's right. It was the Samaritan Messiah this time. Um, Josephus tells the story, which is that the Samaritans were expecting a different Messiah to the Jews. They thought that their Messiah was going to lead them up their sacred mountain, which is Mount Gerizim. But a load of people gathered at the bottom of the mountain, ready to, to climb up the, the mountain and sort of proclaim this man the Messiah. But Pilate sent in the troops and blocked their way up the, the mountain and um, killed quite a few of them. Others ran away, others And did were he kill the, the Samaritan Messiah? Yeah, the, the ringleaders were all executed there and then, you know, I don't Crucified? think... Crucified? Probably, yes. Pilate's treatment of the Samaritans was so brutal that the emperor himself called Pilate back to Rome. But in between the arrogant beginning and the squalid end of his governorship, 
Josephus and others tell of a series of flashpoints between Pilate and the Jews. Josephus also tells us that most of the time the Roman governors lived in Caesarea, Herod's magnificent city by the sea. But when they were in Jerusalem, their headquarters was Herod's magnificent palace, not the Antonia Fortress. Could this be the Praetorium where Jesus was tried? If you had to choose which is the more likely scenario, um, this place for the Praetorium and the judgment of Jesus, or the other place where you have traditions and so on, which would you choose and why? I would choose this place, Herod's Palace. Um, this was the place to stay in town. This was the most magnificent, luxurious place. And it had amazing fortifications. Um, I don't think I don't think Pilate would have gone and stayed in the Antonia Fortress. I, I think Pilate would have made this place his headquarters. The most impressive tower in the fortress is Fazael's Tower. The bottom two thirds are still the original stone from the time of Pilate. And the tower may be the only indisputable physical connection to Jesus. If Jesus was tried in this place, he was very, he, he could have been held in that tower. Jesus would certainly have seen that tower. As he came in from Galilee, he would have seen there were three huge towers on the edge of um, Jerusalem. So he would certainly have seen that. It's again amazing that people are not aware of the archaeology. You know, that should be a spot, you know, uh, on the Via Dolorosa, if you will. Yeah, I know that's right. Perhaps if you were reconstructing the Via Dolorosa nowadays, you might have a rather different route. Maybe you could do a new one. The pilgrims and the tourists should be coming here. But where is the raised stone pavement where the trial took place? The historical sources give one more hint. And when archaeologists followed it, they made an astonishing discovery. Is this what we're talking about? Keys and Toll Toll Bell. Keys and Toll Toll Bell. I'm on the trail of the real Pontius Pilate. So far, I've discovered that the trial of Jesus didn't take place where tradition says. Pilate wasn't the guilt ridden governor portrayed by the Gospels. And if anyone was washing their hands, it was probably the Jewish high priest, not the Roman governor. It appears that the Gospels are shifting the blame from Pilate to the Jews. Herod's palace in Jerusalem is the best candidate for the Praetorium, where the trial took place. And in his description, the historian Josephus says that the governor's tribunal or judgment seat was set before the palace. And when archaeologists dug around the outside walls of the structure, they discovered a gate and the remains of a staircase and next to it, a raised pavement from the time of Jesus. I asked Professor Helen Bond what happened here. I'll run to the Jesus spot, one second. And what it tells us about the Gospels. So we're talking here. Yes, that's the one right up there. I may be standing exactly where Jesus stood. Is that possible? That's right. You could be standing in exactly the spot where, where Jesus stood after Pilate had brought him out. And Pilate says to the assembled chief priests, behold the man. And then Pilate says, shall I execute your king? And the chief priests, of course, say, we have no king but Caesar. The ultimate blasphemy and a terrible thing to say. But do you think, is that later theology trying to shift the blame from the Romans to the Jews? Yeah, I think there's a huge amount of later theology here, particularly in John's Gospel. And he wants to put the blame fairly and squarely on the shoulders of, of the Jewish chief priests. If the trial was held here, it suggests that Pilate was wary of the danger of a Jewish uprising. After all, in the early morning, outside the walls of the city, there would have been no Jewish crowd gathered to watch the trial of Jesus. He should be put to death, he must die. And no reason for Pilate to wash his hands. And it turns out that in the Jewish ritual of hand washing lies the answer to why early Christians told the story this way. Here is Jesus presented to the crowd, probably here. Here's Pilate standing maybe, you know, where you're standing. And then he does something very odd. He washes his hands. Some people may just look at it and say, well, he's washing his hands. Yeah. It's a metaphor. 
But to me, he's doing a Jewish ritual. Well, I think you're exactly right. I think that's exactly what Matthew wants his readers, because remember, they're Jewish Christians, and they know what the washing of hands signifies. But it's, it's hugely ironic that, you know, it should be, it should be the, the Jewish leader who's doing that, but it's the Roman leader. And then you have the Jewish crowd say, his blood be on us and on our children. It's terrible saying that has haunted Jews for the last 2,000 years, and it's only found in Matthew's Gospel. The irony is that Matthew is the most Jewish of the Gospels. <laughs> he might have just been having a, a kind of a internal debate with fellow Jews, never realizing that the words that he penned uh, would result in uh, millions of deaths. I think that's exactly right. And you have to remember, too, that in the late first century, Christians were the small guys, you know, they were the minority, arguing against the large group, the larger Jewish group. Um, of course, those texts look completely different once Christians become the majority, and they're arguing about um, Jewish people who are the minority now. In the late first century, a tiny Jewish Christian group which was trying to convert Romans to their sect, began to write down its stories. In those stories, they cast their fellow Judeans as the villains and lifted the burden of blame from the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. But the archeology span suggests that the trial of Jesus happened here. And so there was no Jewish crowd and no reluctant governor. The evidence suggests that Pontius Pilate's hands remained dirty and that it was the writers of the Gospels who cleaned them. And yet, no matter how hard the Gospels tried to change the story, the fact of the matter is that Pontius Pilate was the only man who had the authority, as well as the psychological, religious and political motivation to crucify Jesus. Jesus. 